Good afternoon. Without my slideshow, I want to kind of just talk off the cuff a little bit about my job and how fortunate I am. Alex, I've had for two years. She's an amazing student, and she's one of about 205 students I see teaching physics every day. I have six classes filled to the brims, and it is a pleasure to get the chance to help guide them on their way, help them look at the world in a new light, but you can see what I've got to deal with. These kids are amazing. They're doing incredible things, so they always keep me on my toes. I never get to relax at all and say, let's take a day off today and just, just put our feet up, although they, they like when I pretend like we're going to do that. I've been at Westlake now for five years. Before that, I taught in the Valley El Camino Real High School in Woodland Hills, and for me, education has been a wonderful thing. I have gotten more out of it than I've given into it. The kids are wonderful. Um, those of you guys who have children in schools, I thank you for training them to have manners. It's an amazing thing. I, it, you don't know how much it's appreciated until you get that one class that forgets the please, the thank you. Um, it's, it's a big, big deal. And I would say, if anything come away from today, is teach your kids that little extra step helps bring us all together. That little bit of politeness makes every day a little bit easier to deal with. And when you get someone in a good mood, they're going to respond to you in a good mood, and everything goes in a positive direction. Um, for physics, um, Don hit it right in the head, it's about inspiring kids, and not just inspiring kids who are going on to physics are going to be engineers. I want the magicians. I want the poets. I want them all. Um, now, not everyone can handle it because it is high-level math, very abstract thinking, but it does help you analyze your own life. It gives you a way of looking at the world from a new angle, and that's what learning is all about, opening your eyes to new experiences and developing a sense of wonder, a sense of awe, and then physics helps you categorize why does it do that? Why does it work? What's the reason behind it? There's got to be a reason this stuff is happening. So you look for things we call the always true equation. What's going to happen every single time, no matter what you do? You go up and slap someone in the face, they're going to get mad. Every single time. That's an always. So it's little things like that that you get better and better and better at. Um, plus, they get to be really annoying in the car when you go around the corner. They can explain it to you and talk about centripetal force and not to call it centrifugal force. And that's one of those things that I really enjoy. We get to, we join a new kind of team where we're no longer like the average citizen. I tell the kids, once you step into my classroom, you've entered into a realm where only about 5% of the planet ever go. And that's to study physics. And it's real. You start thinking and talking about things people don't know about. You're in a secret club. We try and take it one step further, and in a fun way, is we get Westlake High School physics shirts. So all the kids can purchase a shirt and feel part of belonging to something bigger than themselves. Again, that sense of togetherness. So on the back, it's always fun. We try and put some witty, nerdy humor. If you've seen the Big Bang Theory, it's right along that sense of humor. So one of the kids' favorite shirts is there's a picture of a boy and a girl on the back, and it says, I know you're attracted to me. And right in the middle, it's got the formula for gravity, the gravitational force of attraction. So it's things like that that I get to deal with. I have... Kind of a different job, though, is if anyone gets a chance to talk to me, it, it comes across very quickly how much I love my job and how much I love teaching. But I am not your typical teacher, not the, from what I do, but from what I get to work with. Um, in teaching physics, I get the cream of the cream of the crop. Um, just on Thursday, we had kids finding out what schools they were getting into. And we had Stanford, and we had Harvard, and we had Yale, and Princeton, and Duke, and you name it, and they got into it. You know, Berkeley used to be kind of that highlight. And Berkeley, I mean, I could throw a stick in the class and hit 10 people who got into Berkeley. It's amazing, amazing, brilliant kids. And I look at them every day, and I look at what they're doing in class, taking five APs. And then I look at them, what they're doing outside of class, and all their volunteer work, and how they're running their own businesses. We have a group of students, two young students, just made a deal with Microsoft to be their distribution partners for their software they developed while they were freshmen in high school. And I feel like such a slacker. I really, one of these days I'll catch up to them. But I know I couldn't have done it when I was in high school. I could not do what the kids do nowadays. The competition in high school is incredible. And so I'll stop what I'm doing every now and again if I can and try and inspire them, try and talk to them about what it means, to do, what you should do with all this intelligence you have. Where should you go with this, you know, 
why should you not waste it, basically? And they respect that. They, they really like the days that we don't do physics. It's one of their favorite talks. So most recently, when they found out, they found out Thursday afternoon which school they got into and those who didn't get into those schools. And so we had tears in class. We had people really disappointed, you know, hearing other people celebrate. It's hard to, to face that you didn't get into that dream school that you wanted. So we talked about what, what should you choose for a school? What do you want to do? Where do you want to be when you grow up? And a lot of kids said, I really don't know. And I totally understand that and get that. There's a couple of my knuckleheads right there. I told them, don't chase a name brand. Don't chase that school Berkeley because other people told you Berkeley's good. You've got to think what you want in life and then figure out what school matches that sort of attitude, that persona that you have. Where are you going to be happy? Most of all, because you're going to spend four years, maybe five, working super, super hard. You want to enjoy it. You're never going to get this college time back. And if you waste it because you just went after a name brand, you're going to regret it. And I, you think that high school kids are going to go, yeah, well, yada, 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 whatever, quit talking, please. One of my classes gave me a standing ovation at the end of having this discussion. And it kind of floored me. Because they want this. They want to hear these types of discussions from adults. And I know most of your parents out there, when you try and talk to your children like that, they totally, you know, turn the other way. They don't want to hear it from you. But if you have children in your life that are not your own, so friends of yours who have children, take the time to talk to them, ask them what they want, and give them direction. They crave it. They really want that. And they're inspired by your stories. I have really simple, really goofy stories I tell in class all the time. And they continually are awestruck by these simple stories. They just, they just want to hear more and more. My main talk today was going to be an inspiration since I've kind of had to fill a little bit. I'm going to cut it a tiny bit short from what I was going to do, and I'll, I'll kind of hit the highlights. So, Do you remember what you wanted to do when you first grew up? Do you remember what inspired that choice? I do. I remember when I was in school, my teacher, Mrs. Ford, this is fourth grade, she wasn't a very good science teacher, and a buddy of mine went up and talked to her and said, you know, how can we do many experiments? She said, I just, I'm not, I don't feel very confident about it. So she said, but instead of sending me away, she gave me a lab manual and said, why don't you try some experiments at home? So a friend of mine, Randy, and I, we went to my house, and in my kitchen, we did this one experiment I still remember, took a candle, and we took the image of the flame through a magnifying glass, and it showed up on a little screen upside down. And when we brought it into focus, something happened to me. It just, something clicked. And I just said, wow, that is amazing. I want to be a scientist. Well, I never became a scientist, but I became a physics teacher, so pretty close. So then, is it the teacher's responsibility to inspire students? Those of you who have children in the schools, is that our job, to inspire your children? Absolutely not. No. Inspiration cannot be forced upon someone. Those of you guys who have kids, again, if you try and get them to do what you want, they're going to fight it. You push a little harder, they push even harder. So inspiration cannot occur artificially. You can't force it on someone. You can't try and shove it onto people. What needs to happen instead is you need to create opportunities for inspiration. And this is the requirement of teachers. This is what we have to do. We have to set up learning situations where kids can discover passions they didn't know they had where they can find out what they like and what they don't like through experience. So for physics, this comes through hands-on collaborative projects. Now, why is inspiration important in science? You would think that teaching them the science should be enough, but unfortunately, we have a bit of a dilemma right now. In the United States, STEM careers are actually being given away to other countries. Every year, STEM careers, that science, technology, engineering, and math, are growing in number. But the US is producing the same number of graduates in these STEM career majors. Therefore, other nations are filling those extra roles faster than we are. In 2006, the US ranked 32nd out of 90 nations. That was an alarming number, and many universities took notice and tried to change their programs a little bit. They brought in active learning. They tried to reach out to inspire people to take STEM careers. But I think at the college level, that's too late. You need to inspire them earlier. We need to catch them in high school, middle school, and all the way down to elementary school. And what I'm proposing today, teachers can do in other classrooms as well. 
So what I've seen successful in inspiring students to pursue these STEM careers is academic competitions. Especially in science, research shows, and I've seen it personally, that when students have to study something in depth for, to compete at a higher level, the understanding leads to a greater amount of interest, which leads to many of them choosing that as a major and going on to um, choose as a career. I've been involved with three competitions. Um, most recently, um, robotics, but in the past, Envirothon, a resource management competition, and Science Olympiad. I'm kind of a part-time coach on that, and that's a science uh, factual-based and project-based competition. With robotics, I've seen there's two key elements that really engage kids and want to inspire them into these STEM careers. That's hands-on learning and working in group collaborative projects. When the kids work in these teams and it feels like they're working on an authentic science project, they enjoy it. You can see it on their faces. They tend to really like what's going on. In robotics, the kids take on different roles on the team. Some of them will take on the role of engineer, putting together a pile of nuts, bolts, metal, and motors, and turning that into a working robot, while other students take on the role of computer programmer, and they'll write the code for the, co the robot telling it what to do and when to work. Now, if the whole team doesn't work as a collaborative unit, if they're not working together, then the robot sits there and does nothing. And believe me, we spend many, many hours discussing why is the robot doing nothing. It's a very common problem. So, these projects become like a giant puzzle. And like many puzzles, they are enticing, they're fun, and they're addicting. The kids can't get enough of it. The kids who come in for these teams do it on their own time. They're coming after hours. So on top of studying for their five AP classes, they're coming in twice a week, two hours to build, and then going to all-day competitions on the weekend. But when a project does work, when the pieces come together, the sense of satisfaction, the pride in their faces, you can see it, and it's worth it. The group work leads to them building, forging alliances, creating better friendships, and learning that other people will motivate you and stimulate you to do better. In prepping for competition, the kids have to learn what their project means in great detail, how to build it or how to manipulate it during the competition. So they get a deeper understanding than just factual knowledge. Now, rote facts are important, but it's the deep understanding that leads students to pursue it to want to learn more, to want to continue doing that later on in life. I have found that many of my students who have graduated have come back to me and tell me about how much the competition meant towards them deciding what they want to do in college and beyond. Especially my students who I had at my previous school through Envirothon, many of them have gone on to pursue environmental careers because of that competition. So, what is it about those competitions that is so successful? It is the working togetherness, above all, that really inspires the kids. So I had to take that and bring it into my classroom. And so I don't reach to 20 kids in the team, but my 205 students I see every day. And so I design activities that if you were to see my classroom, it looks like complete chaos. But we have these little pods of students working inside. Some of these have to go outside to find room. And even though it looks chaotic, if you pay attention, you see them actively engaged in what I like to call academic play, where they're allowed to experience. All the students are engaged, and most of them are being challenged. The students are given projects that allows them to bring in their own inspiration, their own creativity, and create something solely theirs. I really encourage them to combine art and science. I like the poets. I like the kids who are in AP Art Studio. It gives kids a chance to see how important it is to work as a unit, because if one person on the team doesn't do their job, the whole team suffers. Some of the projects may not look very nice, but I tell them it's a prototype. It's what it demonstrates that matters, not how it looks. And the projects can be really frustrating. In fact, oftentimes they fail and we have lots of tears. So I design projects where I reward what's learned and what they put into the project that gets the grade, not whether it's successful or not. After all, Edison did say, I now know a thousand ways not to make a light bulb. It's true, in science we learn just as much from failure as we do from success. In addition to inspiring students to go on to STEM careers, they get something they don't get in a normal classroom. Unfortunately, we don't teach how to deal with other people in a workplace situation. 
we give them all this factual knowledge in the classroom, but don't sh- tell them how to share it with one another if they're going to do the whole rest of their lives. It's kind of a weird dilemma that we skip over in school. We teach fact, but not how to emulate that fact to somebody else clearly. I'm sorry. So not everyone likes the project as much as these two did. Um, but it does engage all the students in teamwork. It forces them to collaborate. It teaches those essential skills, time management, work delegation, how to collaborate effectively, how to communicate what's going on to the whole group. And that's really important. As the teams proceed and get better at working together, their confidence, not just in themselves, but in one another, their trust in other people goes way up. And you can see they start selecting who they want to be on their team. Um, Sometimes the projects are a bit of a disaster. And what's interesting is my best test takers oftentimes turn in the worst projects. They're textbook smart, but they can't make the link to how things work in the real world. So the projects act to reinforce that link between here's what's on the page, here's what happens in real life. And it gives them a sense of, oh, so that's what's going on. What's great, though, is when that B student, the really quiet one in the corner, turns in an amazing project, the whole class applauds, gives them tons of praise, they get to be the star for the day. And that's an amazing sense that happens and is really important. Now, at the end of the year, I asked my students to give me feedback on what they thought of the course and what they liked and didn't like. And one of my students responded to the group projects this way. Competitive group work is what makes physics class stand out from my other six periods. When your friends are counting on you, that's a powerful motivation to study. Physics is not a math class, it's a puzzle class. So, if we want students to love science and pursue it later, let's not just teach science, let's let them do science. Thank you.